Hey, Trevin, what's going on? Hi, James. Uh, still trying to get my uh, cabal built to work, so it's taking lo longer than I thought. Yeah, I'm curious about that. Let's make sure. I'm just reading your latest comment right now. So I'm using the git checkout next node, which uses the Cardano node 1.35. Mm -hmm. And it's not even done downloading. Well, as the other two versions, I think that was pretty quick. I think this is like a either complete change or I don't know. I don't think it's going to work, but we'll see. You sound like you've done this before. Is this your first time? Uh, no, I did this in the Plutus Pioneers program, and it worked. So I th I assume that this is because of the, probably like some changes in the Plutus apps. Oh, man, I'm really curious about this one. Yeah, this one's new to me, and I hadn't seen it yet. I haven't seen anyone complain in the uh, issues section about something in one specific. So I can you know run that back the bit you were saying about the node version where like I have I have a newer version of node running on my computer, but that's not integrating at all with when I try to run the REPL. Where is 1.35 coming into play for you? So that's if you use git checkout next node. Next node, right. Good. And that, like you yeah, said, so that's I, not working either, but that wasn't the original problem. Uh, I'm not done downloading, but I don't think it's going to work because it's it should be, there's probably a lot more changes here mm -hmm. and it's not stable. Right. Good morning. Good morning. What's up, Juan? How are you? Super, super energized. Hey, Krish, Bizwajit, good to see you. Amir, Curtis, Sam, nice frog you got there. Thank hey, you. Sydney. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening. And good evening. Mm, yes. So I was setting up my next shell <laughs> and it seems that it's working or not working. And Chris, you've gotten it working before, right? In the past? Um, sorry, James, I lost your I lost the connection. Can you please uh, say yeah. it again? Have you successfully gotten Nick Shell running in the past? No, actually. So, oh, okay. like, I installed Nix and I received that flake error. So, after that, there was a certain command. I was trying to run that and it's still running. Okay. Like, I executed, like, I executed that command around uh, three hours ago and it's still running i don't know how much time will it take but let's see it's yeah, funny you... i believe i'm having the same i tried again this morning and it gave me the same uh it told me to run the flakes uh command and i i did that but it's been running for a while now Chris, when you said three hours, that's it's funny you said that because that's exactly where that's that's when I start to worry. I've heard a lot of cases of right around three hours. So it's hard to know if you're close right now or if something else is coming up. 
And when um, you guys are setting this up, is that on a VM or is that on your Mac M1? I'm on a VM on a PC. Okay. Okay. Hey, Curtis. Hey, James. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, no, no. I was just putting this up to get a pulse check. If you're just showing up, you can see on the screen just a quick poll. And this is our focus today. I, I want to know who's who's got Plutus apps running and, and we're good so far, um, but also to kind of split out if we need to into groups to kind of troubleshoot some of these other issues. Um, Trevin and I were talking, we were the first two on this call just about, um, there's new errors for even for people who have gotten Nick's shell running in Plutus apps before uh, some of the latest changes are introducing new errors. Flakes is just one example of that, right? That that used to be something that wasn't a concern in earlier checkouts. Now it is. It's an easy one to fix. And hopefully we could say the same thing about some of the errors that are coming up now. Uh, but we still have to discover what those answers are. Yeah, Chris, what are you thinking? Yeah, so I had just like, can you hear me right now properly? Yep. Sound good. Yeah. So basically, I just had a suggestion, or it just struck my mind. Like instead of using our local terminal, like WSL or anything like that, if we use something like Google Workspace Terminal or something like a cloud server, something like that, which is free also, and like we can install Linux, will that thing work? Because over there, we'll be having the same environment and. Like even if we just copy paste those terminal command lines, it will just work for everyone. Like it can be done. Like this, like if someone is having an Mac M1 PC, someone is having an Intel, someone is having an AMD PC. So configuration changes, but in cloud PCs, it's just one configuration. That's right. That's that's such a cutting edge question and it's so important. And I haven't tried it yet, but I think you're right. We could, we could run the Nix environment on a cloud server and then be able to use that server perhaps to compile our Plutus scripts. And stepping back, that's really all we need Nix shell to do. It's really nice to have access to the Cabal REPL and to be able to test out your commands as you build. So that's you know, we we will certainly be uh, asking more of a server like that soon enough. Um, but right now, it's true. All we need this thing to do is compile scripts for us, and sharing that as a resource would probably be great. And it introduces a whole new set of concerns. Right? Is that is that server actually secure? Can we trust it to compile these scripts safely? These are the kind of questions we're gonna ask later in this course. Um, is anybody else interested in exploring that as an option? Yeah, I think TX Pipe is working on something like that. So yeah, I, I can't wait to, to use it, but I don't know when they're gonna release it. I'm curious to find out more information on, on what they're doing and how they're doing it. I did create one myself for a, a few friends of mine that are in the Emergo class. And we all were operating on, um, this was an AWS EC2 instance. I built up the NICs and Cabal and had everything working and shared it out. When the first month's bill came in, it was like a couple hundred bucks. And I said, okay no more. <laughs> I can't really afford to support, you know, every, everybody and, and not be able to do it. So in my case, it was a cost restriction. Um, and then I did actually build out a Replit um, version. So it was running uh, Nix and Cabal on REPL. And that was free because all I was doing was 
sharing out my image. And then they would kind of run their own version of the image on REPL. Um, that one was, was a good option. But as James mentioned, it kind of comes down to when you share images and things with you know, the community, they have to trust that what you're running is not malicious or, uh, and this runs in the browser. So, you know, I'm just concerned with, with that trust sense and, and do people trust it? <clears throat> what could potentially be harmed if they ran with that? So. It's funny because for a teaching environment, it's probably fine. And for a mainnet environment, if you were actually building a DAP, it's something you would just never do, right? You just only on the most trusted environment would you want to be compiling scripts like this. Um, so there's that level of expertise that people want to build. Um, but if there's a subset of folks in this course who want to get together, and share a service like that. Uh, if it comes down to an issue of cost, that's something that Gimbal Pool can help out with. Um, that, that's why we have you know, that state pool running. Um, so let me know if there's a group that wants to run with something like that, or Curtis, if you wanna pick something like that back up. Um, Lucas, what's going on? Hey guys, all good? good yeah. Sorry, I was a bit late. All good. So we're talking about options for, for running Plutus apps and especially options considering how little we really needed to do at the moment. Um, and so another even simpler version is a buddy system in this course. When you think about looking at uh, the validator code, obviously for anybody who's gotten this far, the first Plutus script we're gonna have you compile is the always succeeds contract. And there's probably copies of this Plutus script just floating around the internet. And so if there's anybody in this course who already has the compiler working, um, feel free to let others know. And if you're struggling to get the compiler working, that's just one part of what we want to do with the course. You could still have a colleague here share the compiled Plutus script with you. And then as long as you've got your testnet node running, you could still use that script to build transactions, or as you'll see later, uh, to integrate with the front end. And we'll more formally suggest that buddy system on Canvas, but I want you just to have that in mind think about the different pieces of what we're building. And this is a great way for teams to form too, because the truth is, if you actually have a team of several people and one person's probably gonna be your Plutus specialist, uh, they can run that compiling step and then share the script with the rest of the team. Sebastian, good morning. So we got a pretty even split right here. Some folks got Nick Shell running in Plutus apps, um, others still working on it. Um, I know that for some folks, this is a time constraint. It's, it's just, we're not sure if it's because of the binary caches yet or if something else is happening, but for one reason or another, it's taking a while. Um, thank you for I your patience. Oh, go ahead. I'm happy to announce my shell is not working. Oh, so wait, how long did it take total? Uh, this time it took probably about uh, like 10 minutes. And that's on the, the 2022-04-06? Yes. Awesome. Congrats, way to go. Um, to, it's, I know it's at least, I know Uli's on the call. Is Jing here? I don't see. I, so I know we've got a small cohort of people who are grappling with M1, and I didn't find anything satisfying yet. Uli, it sounds like you've gone really deep into that. 
and and thanks. And I want to I want to stick with you and see who else can get together uh, to get these things working. Um, any latest updates on that? No, not at the moment. I'm a little bit <laughs> tired to have yeah. the whole day installing, and so yeah. take a pause and maybe tomorrow. Then <laughs> we'll yeah. see. Good. We'll we'll keep digging for you. I didn't find anything yet, but I don't want to. I don't want to stop yet, and I want to see who else I can call about this. Um, so we'll keep you posted. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, M1 is is the shorthand name for Apple's new chip. Um, when did that change happen? A year or two ago. And yeah, at the architectural level, it just it it made a lot of uh, backwards compatibility impossible. So developers have been working on it since since then. And then I know there was at least one comment in the discussion boards related to this last question. You're okay, but Cabal REPL hasn't worked yet. Um, what discussion board was that on? Oh, that was Trevin. Okay. Right. You, you've got, and so this one's new. Has anybody else seen what Trevin is describing here? Because this one is new to me. So is this also on a Mac M1? Yes. Okay. So it looks like it's the same problem like with the build because we have here failed to Failed to build Byron, and that was following my error, my build error also. So I think you, when you call Cabal build, you will have the same error, maybe. Is this done within Nick shell? I sometimes get errors like that when I'm not in Nick shell. No, Nick shell is running. I would try. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but. <laughs> I yeah, did get that build error. failed also, huh? Yeah. I did get that error once when I, I was in Plutus apps and I had master checked out, but that was just my case. Yeah, but if, if Cabal build fails, then Cabal REPL won't won't run. Will will also fail. That's the problem, I think. Oh yeah, you're searching for another for another oh, check. No. I'm just yeah. writing a note and I want to check. I'm looking for no, because this is right. No, this is happening in Plutus apps. No, no this is happening. Trevin, you got Nick Shell running. What directory did you run Cabal REPL in? In the, uh, I think it's, it's where the Cabal the project file is at. For the, for the PBL course project one. Yes. Yeah, and let me double check that. Uh, this is fairly at bottom of the page. All right. All right. Now that's a deeper dive, but I'm, I want to be on this issue. And if anybody else has seen anything or, or is, is looking for the same, let's just be sure to share uh, the results of this search. And I'm so sorry. I, I, uh, we, <laughs> I need an M1 computer to try to see some of these errors and see what the heck is going on. And thank you both for your patience dealing with this.
Okay, we're going to figure that out. I'm just switching back here to the mentee. What other questions do folks have? You can unmute or drop in the chat, or you can use this mentee board that was shared earlier. Great questions. Okay, so test net sync. Yeah, so this is a great conceptual question. Um, it is mandatory to have your test net node synced if you want to submit a transaction that way for two reasons. One, you can, you can only query for the UTXOs that are actually in your wallet right now. Uh, if you have the most up-to-date version about the ledger, and that requires having your nodes synced up. Two, when you build a transaction and submit it, it needs to be picked up by the blockchain that is already up-to-date. And you would actually see this notification. Um, I'll try to show a little bit about that in, in an upcoming video. Um, but when you actually submit a transaction, you can look at where your node is running and you're getting those messages that the chain is being extended. And you can actually see your transaction enter the mempool, which means that it's it's basically the chain is aware of it and it's waiting to be picked up and added to the next block or, or, or an upcoming block on the chain. Just like being able to compile Plutus scripts locally, Testnet is going to play a role in this course, but it's not going to be everything, right? So this is another thing that's a really good tool to have up and running. And there's lessons that you'll be able to follow along with step by step if you do have that node running. While at the very same time, when it comes to building a front end, you don't need to have the test net node synced at all, okay? So again and again throughout this course, you'll kind of see what you can do with each of these tools, but you'll be able to make progress even if somehow we, we don't manage to get them set up. I see this question, do we need to run Git checkout first before running Nix shell? You know, anybody here, has anybody here been able to run Nix shell in the main branch of the Plutus apps repo? I did initially, because I checked out. Check out anything or any tag, and I just went along with building it and doing Nix shell and everything. And I was just on the, on the final release of Plutus apps. Uh, Lucas, you just got real quiet for some reason. Uh, can you still hear me or no? That's better. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I was just saying when in it, when I did my setup, I I cloned uh, Plutus apps, and I didn't select any tag or or check out anything. I just went ahead and built things, and then you actually told me that I need to go back 
and do the V2022, April 6th. So uh, when I did that, it took a, a long time to, to build uh, Cabal and Grep. I, I, I took it all the way to doing Grepl. But it all um, worked. Yeah, yeah. Cool. On the VM, which was slow as hell. Now I'm bare metal, actually. I just basically installed everything on an external SSD on my Windows machine. And I'm booting off the external uh, SSD with bare metal Linux. And that's it. I'm sure that feels good. Right yeah, it's a lot better. <laughs> Last week, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, so that's that's kind of the indirect answer to this question that was posted. Do we need to run Git checkout first? No, as you just heard from Lucas, you can simply run Nix shell in the main branch of the Plutus apps repo. Um, it sounds like it might be slower that way, but we can maybe we'll have to benchmark that on the bare metal as well. Um, but right, the, the reason for running git checkout in the first place is to get a particular version of the Plutus apps repo. Um, I can't speak to the fine point differences between each of these. Uh, that's, that's something I haven't had time to go too deep into. Uh, but if anybody's aware of like any of the big differences between any of those, that's a fun thing to share anytime. And Trevin's point here in the chat, that's spot on. Yeah, so if you've done this before, and for example, you wanna use the version of Plutus apps that's in the Plutus Pioneers program, um, and that's worked before, absolutely use that. That's no problem. Hey, Steven, what's going on? <clears throat> yeah hi there sorry i've been out of action for a few days <laughs> the heat got to me here <laughs> yeah, man. you okay I, yeah it's, it sounds like quite an ordeal over there yeah i was just getting a bit too much <laughs> so i had to take some time out yeah but i'm back now but um yeah i just uh so i'll probably do what lucas doing and do a bare metal install rather than go crazy with a vm <laughs> <laughs> good Good. Yeah. Do you do you have experience with running any of this on an M1 Mac? No, I was just googling some okay. stuff. I do have an M1 Mac, um, and some of the blog posts that are quite alarming. I'm not sure to install it natively on a dual boot or something. Um, so I, I can see why that's why someone might have gone down. I can't remember his name now. Is it? Um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I mean, I think so. The method that people have seen to be using is um, the Mac version of a VM. Um, I'm not sure if that's you know going to work though. Um, so yeah, as I say, just just some basic googling. So yeah, yeah. Go I'm kind of reluctant to experiment on my M1, given some of the stuff I've seen. So <laughs> you're hearing um, about systems getting messed up. Yeah. On that, but that, I think that's more for um the method where you would do kind of a dual boot with the Nix OS. Because I've seen it. So, you know, it should be okay as a VM, but then the question is, does it work as a VM on the M1? I'm not sure. I haven't seen anything on that. Yeah, I was looking for for some some way of running the virtual box machines that we just built on the Macs, but I don't think there's virtual box for Mac Mac OS. So yeah, there's some also, there's some called a UTM. Um, I can put it in chat. Um, there's a blog post here that people might be using. Um, maybe one way of of leveraging your M1 would be. Well, it could. Is it possible to just install Ubuntu on the M1 instead of uh, Mac OS? Yeah, I think that's what I think. I, I when I googled it, I found two alternatives. One is the UTM, which is like a VM version for the Mac, the M1 mm -hmm. Mac, and the other one is some sort of dual boot or using a Linux install. Maybe you could do what I'm doing instead, like uh, booting. I preserved my Windows inside the, the computer. 
yeah. but I have an external boot, which is bare metal Ubuntu. Maybe you could do that between the Mac OS in your machine and an external Ubuntu, but be careful about the booting. Yeah, yeah because if you start yeah. messing with your partitions in your WEF or I don't know, in Windows now, my machine only boots from time to time. I have to yeah. go to the BIOS, the, the BIOS or, you know. If I, if I had to use the M1, I might do that. I don't have to use it. That's why I don't want to muck around with it. So, because uh, it's, yeah, you know, it would just be a real nightmare <laughs> to do that. So if you can use bare metal, I'd rather use a bare metal machine like you're doing when you look at the yeah. SSD or just a, you know. Um, but I'm not sure what the circumstances are for the for um, the person who needs to use. Um, is it? I'm not. I might mangle his name. Sorry if he's here. Xing Xi, Xing Xi, and he's getting a um, a trace warning uh, on an unsupported platform on the VM, on the UTM. He's using. And he's using a DBM VM on a you know. Yeah. So yeah, I could try installing the UTM on the M1 because that wouldn't risk the disk or anything, and then see if I can reproduce his error. Maybe if he's just installed in Nix. What about Roberto's question in the chat about Docker? Has anybody tried running Plutus in Docker on an M1? No. Have you used Docker on that M1 for anything else yet? Well, I don't think so, no. I know they were a little behind. I, I haven't heard the latest on Docker working. I know that it took them a while in the first place to get working on M1s. Um, I've tried to install DBSync with Docker, but there I have not enough memory, so okay. no. Not really. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, to this new Lucas. Um, okay. Uh, I was just gonna say, Lucas, if you have any good resources for the steps for um, doing the bare metal uh, Nick setup, that'd well, be good. Because I tried to look that up the first time and. Yeah, I found a lot of good resources, but a lot of them assumed you knew a lot of stuff already. So I do have a part. So uh, I did uh, some notes the same way I did for the VMs for the initial version two and three. I have a number of notes further down, but um, let me take a look. Yeah, I have I have here what would be the VM version four, where I followed this document. I'm dropping it in the chat. And so this is for bare metal of Linux, uh, but this comes up from the Plutus pioneers. Uh, is that okay to share? Oh yeah. But uh, it's basically what we have on our course, which goes to the, um, the cache settings and all of those things. There's the link. And let me just revise my notes. Thank you. Sure. So I went with the single user version there, which is basically just do a pseudo APT uh, update and then the SH with no daemon to install Nix. And then that's it. It's literally just two lines of code. And then there's this one optional about. Uh, environment variables, if you don't want to restart your terminal, and the cache setting. It's really just this to set it up without multi-user. When things work, it's almost magical, isn't it? And then, yeah, we also had a question about someone that's using WSL for the Nix cache, for the Nix.conf file. Not sure if that person is in the call now. 
Do we have anyone using uh, WSL? Mm, yes, I'm using WSL. And did you notice? Uh, can you can you share with us where your mix.conf file is? In terms no, of I actually created. If should I share my screen in order to show you? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so basically, like I was able to install Nix. So I was able to install Nix and I was able to use it. So here is where I installed Nix. I can show you in folders. I actually created it myself only. So when I went into this etc folder, you can find I created a folder named Nix over here. This Nix, and I manually created this Nix.config file using the sudo mkdir command, all those things. And uh, I think Lucas is trying to speak, but he is muted. I was going to ask when, when you were just there with the folder inside, could you, could you switch back to that so I can take a snipping and share it with the uh... Even even within the next folder. Yes. Uh, wait. So, so this is the so in the WSL you'll go in the Ubuntu section. Mm -hmm. In Ubuntu you'll have the etc. Mm -hmm. Inside etc you'll find a folder named Nix. If okay. there is no folder named Nix, you'll create a folder named Nix using sudo mkdir command. All those things, right? And okay. after creating this, you need to create an nix.config file. Okay. Same. Okay. This also needs to be created using the administrator command, sudo touch and all those commands. So with this command, I created this nix.config file and I was able to uh, oh. install it. That's right now only it got installed. Like you see, like over here only the nix shell was running. So I just thought of like exiting nix shell and trying to run again. So I'm so I just ran this next shell command, normal next shell, not about this flex error. So now I actually want to ask, do I need to run this next shell extra experimental features flex every time whenever I run next shell? You can you can configure it in your next conf. There's something that if you check the the Discord channel, I dropped something in there just this morning where I'm showing what I'm doing, but um, you can also Google for that because it's really just uh, two lines of code. Okay. One, one line of code that you, you put it in your conf file, nix.conf file, and it assumes, oh, there it is. So it's really just okay. doing, adding a line saying experimental slash features equals nix command flakes. And, um, and one more thing I wanted to ask, like, uh, if I make my default terminal as the Nix terminal, like will that work fine? Because the Nix is also in another Linux. Because I've created this uh, Ubuntu WSL, this uh, Linux terminal just for the Bluetooth thing. I'll not do anything else onto this, like purely Bluetooth stuff. So if I want to make Nix terminal as my default terminal, like whenever I start up this Ubuntu WSL, it should automatically run Nix. Is it possible somehow? I'm not sure at all. Because I'm, I'm never, I'm never used the the terminal, the mm. WSL part. Sorry. That's interesting. Oh, no problem. I'll just see to it. So I dropped you a link on the on the chat here where you can go and see that flakes flag. Mm, yes. uh, could you just ta I'll tab to back to the folder explorer where you had your conf file. Yeah, I just wanted to take if you allow me a snipping of this screen. So I can share with your colleague about the the folder. Can I share the snip folder? Like okay, like you can take a snip like yeah. this. I'll show it to you. What if you if could you click on the dress bar on the top in front of Nix? There you go. Thanks. So no, it's I, if you want, I can copy the path from here only. No, copy That's fine. path. I'll, I'll I've taken the snipping and I'll drop it into the chat for your colleague. Thanks. Yes, no problem. I'm just curious on the 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 Nix uh, shell question on having that being the default um, interpreter. So I guess 
couple questions. How would you point it to the repo that you want it to run in? And what happens if there's errors when it's running? Can you troubleshoot it? I mean, if it, right, if your instance fails to to launch just because there's some Nix shell error, can you revert back to Bash and then troubleshoot the issue, or how how would you figure that out? I guess because I'm quite interested myself. Yeah, so I face another error over here. Like whenever I run any Nix command, like it just runs this few lines of traces and it just stops in between and it takes literally around like 30 to 20 minutes to actually come again back i don't know why so will it take so will it always take so that's so that was my main concern so if i can make my next uh, terminal as my default terminal so half of the problem is sorted like i'll just come and i'll just execute my command because lit nix is also in turn a linux terminal only you know so how it matters, like you can use next or Ubuntu terminal. So that's why. Now, as you can see, I just exited the terminal and I'm trying to run again. It takes the time. That's yeah. the thing. It, it won't take this long every time. Okay. So the first one is, will take the longest because a lot is being downloaded right now. And we have to step back and think about the role that Nick Shell is playing here. This is setting up a, a local shell environment that is specific to the Plutus apps project that you have here. And so if you downloaded another project, whether it was a Git repo or from wherever else that had its own Nix setup, hey, you're in. It worked. That's it. That's it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Congrats. Um, but right, so it would be different for each project. So so I think it's it's probably no to, to what you're directly looking for. But the reason for that is you want within your Ubuntu subsystem to be able to have any number of projects there and within each of them run the particular configuration of Nix that's specified. Mm, yeah, all right. Like I saw like it's taking less time. So probably I'll just run a few times and I'll see. Like maybe with time it'll just run faster. If I, I hope so. I think I think it'll be faster than that in the future. But that wasn't so bad. How long was that? What 10 minutes? No, like this was I think my third time okay. <laughs> exiting and starting it again. Okay. So probably it's good. So this was one thing. Second thing I also wanted to ask you that, uh, what was that question? Uh, give me a second. Like you guys can continue. Just that question just slipped up from my mind. Sorry. Well, hey, so the other really hardcore approach would be just to use Nix OS, right? And I, I don't know if anybody on this call has run that directly. I know Alex has been playing with that. So you might want to connect with him. Um, and so it's probably possible to set up a VM that just is running an instance of Nix OS, um, but that's not something I have any expertise in. Could be interesting. Oh, you have that? No, that's, you have Ubuntu. Oh, okay. No, actually, like initially, I installed NixOS also. So in that Word document file where all the things were given, I installed that um, virtual box for that Linux Mint having that thing, but that seemed not working pretty well. So I straight away went for the NixOS. NixOS with that Plasma, ID, I think the KD version. I installed that and it was running well, but sim like it's it was in virtual machine and I am on in PC, so of course it's running slow. So that's why I was figuring out for WSL. That's the best option. Okay. Well, hey, I'm glad that's running now. Um and let's let's keep in mind this idea of 
maybe running some services. Again, I just, if anybody is interested in running, in, in running with that idea and coordinating with other folks here uh, to spin up a cloud instance of basically, a, we, we'd be running Plutus apps on a cloud instance. Am I saying that right? Curtis, is that? I mean, it would be no different than like a VM, but just hosted in the cloud. Okay. Yeah. The, the expressed purpose of which would be to be running Plutus apps in this case, so people can jump into that and, and use it from elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. We, there's kind of a conversation, though, to start with that. Like in my case, it was with friends, so I was able to open up right. the firewall, and I right. was totally fine with that. Right. Yeah, the, just kind of a conversation on how to secure it if it needs to be secured. Right. Um, yeah, user accounts and then providing those user accounts. That way they can't modify the system, but then can they run? I didn't really go down this path. I always gave my friends admin rights. So if they try to run an X shell and it's installing new dependencies, can they do that as a straight user or do they need permissions? I don't actually, to be honest, I don't know because... I kind of gave permissions, so. Hmm. You sound like Roberto talking about dandelion right now. This is, <laughs> right, these are all the concerns. So actually, and this reminds me, um, we will talk more about dandelion later in this course, but on Monday, uh, just a few days from now, uh, July 25th, my colleague and co-founder Roberto um, is presenting at Emergo Academy uh, and for two hours talking about network security. Sebastian's excited about it. <laughs> yeah. I am too. Super. So yeah, so that's at 1130 UTC. 11, I'll put that in the chat and we'll, we'll announce this on Discord as well. Um, <laughs> On That's Monday, right. I know. I'm really sorry about that. We had no, to... no, no, no. <laughs> we had to navigate three, it. We'll, yeah, yeah, we'll nice record time. that too. Yeah, it's good for for it's good for all the team. It's a victory for all the team. Congratulations to all. We are a team, man. So excited! No, it's it's really exciting. It's really exciting, and it's it's overdue. So looking forward to to attend to that session as well. Yeah. That's going to be awesome. And Chris, I'm sorry, I'm just now catching up to your conversation in Discord. I literally just woke up this morning and came straight to, to this meeting, and I'm, I'm seeing that you were asking questions on WSL. I'm sorry I didn't respond to you, but it sounds like you actually got it working and you followed the same steps I took, which was to create my own Nix directory and Nix.com file. Uh, so I'm glad you got it working, and I apologize for not responding. Uh, no problem like it's it, it's just that from last like from tomorrow only like from like from last two days i'm trying to present this thing and things are getting pretty stuck that's why yeah so i actually wanted to show you something like i don't know like how much expert i am in this thing but if you allow me to share screen i would like to share something like what was my idea actually That's quite quite interesting, by the way. I never knew that the Windows subsystem could do that. So is it, if it's running quite stable, that's quite useful information for students. Yeah. So basically, I wanted to show you this thing. Like, this is the Google Cloud Console platform. So I don't have much experience using this thing. It's just that in some Coursera courses, I've used this cloud terminal platform so like this is a linux terminal i don't know like what are the configurations of this terminal so i was just asking that this cloud shell is like almost same for everyone if we could run linux if we could run next on this thing and we could connect it via an ssh to our local system like um, setting up next for anyone who comes next would be actually easier that was the thing i wanted to ask uh, yeah, that's actually different than uh, an EC2 or a host running it. That actually makes more sense. So this is just a shell uh, interface. It's not, do, it, do you know if it's running 
independent instances. So if you were to log in and I log in, are we running against the same host or are we running our own copies of that image essentially? I really don't have an answer for this question, but we in. need to look into this thing. But yeah, that's my, point, yeah. but my thing was like, uh, like some people are using Mac, some people are using Windows, some are using Linux. Like everyone is having different different terminals. If if we could have an like a unique like a unique like a same terminal for everyone, uh, which is having same configuration, sort of same configuration, then it would be pretty easier because ultimate goal is not to learn Nix and Nix terminal, but we need to learn fruit testing. That's the thing. I mean, Curtis, to get around the uh, cloud security issue, could you do separate instances, step separate instances of everything, or? Yeah. So essentially, you could have it where it's just an image, and when uh, somebody requests to use that image, it stands up an independent instance of it, and then they're kind of operating on their own. Uh, and then the next person would come and it would stand up another instance using that same image. So yes, you could. There is a difference in the cost model for something like that. It's generally a bit more expensive if more people are running simultaneously. Yeah. But if it's kind of hit and miss, then it's about the same price. So yes, absolutely. That's that's an option. I suppose in a student environment, you you expect students to break things. So <laughs> mm -hmm. so maybe the cost is worth it or do you think it's more you know, yeah good good question i agree and Chris, you kind of got me thinking too on this environment setup. I agree. If we got just something exactly like you just showed, uh, Google Cloud Shell, and everybody's running on a functioning system, it's all you know the same for everybody. Everybody has the same experience. That's great. And then you get through the course, you do your project, everything works, and then we set you free and you go on your own. You can't use that shell interface anymore, right? Now you need to start working on your own and you start running into all these same issues that everybody's hitting. Would you feel more confident in troubleshooting those issues at that point because you've gone through this? Or would you prefer to have access to Gimbal Labs during the course and ask these support questions during the course to get your in individual uh, environment set up? Uh, you know, like what, what, what do you think? Roberto, your hands up. I think it would definitely lower the barrier to entry for, at least for new developers. To me, the most frustrating part of the experience has been the tooling by far because it is just so, so out of my uh, scope of what I know, right? I know a little bit of code and I can set up stuff. I can learn terminal and everything. But once we got to Nix OS and that was, that was really, really intimidating for me. And I, I'm doing the Murgle, but most of the time I even couldn't focus on the class because I was distracted just trying to set up the environment. So I'm at the point where I am now trying to catch up with the REPL working and trying to work through the examples right and that's to me that's the most important part because that's that's what gets you in that's what gets you hooked yeah, very good point maybe we should be like we should be approaching it in two different ways like teaching about setting up the environment separately from the REPL so as you say like the way so you can sort of dive in and do the coding style you know and then that's one thing. And as you say, Curtis, that in the wild, that's not so good because in the wild, you're going to have to, you know, set up your development environment. But is that a separate course offering? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it really could be based just based on the number of available options that you have, right? If you're running on M1 or Docker or in the cloud or WSL or even Windows, you know, if you have all these different options and then there was a sp specific course just for setting up your dev environment, I could see it. Yeah.
there was a question on the menti board that is also related to all of these concerns um, somebody just asked about the, the memory requ requirements um, for running your local node. <clears throat> and this is true as well, right? So hardware requirements are going to be an issue in any number of ways. In some, in some cases, they make it hard to set up your Nix environment and to get Plutus apps running. In other cases, there might just be, you know, very practical limitations to being able to run a node locally. And what's really interesting about right now is that these are all the problems too that are leading to other innovations. So just even hearing Krish and Curtis talk about the possibility, right? What are what are the advantages and disadvantages of something like using this Google Cloud platform? That leads to the kinds of ideas that we need people having. Plutus being hard to set up, that leads to things like Plutarch being developed. So anybody's anybody who's heard of Plutarch, it is built on PureScript, which is a functional programming language that looks 90% similar to Haskell, but compiles to JavaScript modules that you can insert directly into a project. So one outcome of this work is to get maybe really creative about setting up a Plutus dev environment. Another is, if you get really pissed off about setting up Plutus, go check out Plutarch, right? And I've done both. I actually, I'm kind of loving learning Plutarch and PureScript right now. And I'm really glad I got some Haskell background, but I'm also really grateful that people are developing tools like that. And that's just one example. So when it comes to running the node, just to give you the context for this course, the only reason we want you running a, a node locally is because it will allow you to build some transactions using Cardano CLI by hand. And you'll get a little bit of experience with what some server side scripts might need to do if you're building a dApp at scale. However, you don't need to actually do that process. You might just want to take in some of that content maybe buddy up with somebody who has the node running and you can meet for an individual call to work through that together. And then once we get to building front ends, all of that building with Cardano CLI is actually unnecessary. It's really good background for you to have from a knowledge and learning part, but it's not necessary at all to start using the Cardano serialization libraries from a development perspective. Um, so the reason I'm sharing all of this is this, this is the thing, right? I don't want anybody to think right now that we are getting distracted or derailed from Plutus development. We're actually doing it right now by getting into all of these, all of these little problems that pop up along the way. And there are a lot of creative approaches already taking root in the community. Yeah, we can link to the basics about Plutarch. That's a big thing to take on. And anybody who, yeah, I, I do think this course can still be helpful to get you to the point where then you'll want to learn Plutarch and you'll be a little bit more ready for it. Uh, but I also wouldn't blame anybody who goes down into that development path and says, oh my gosh, I, I want to keep going with this. And we certainly need a study group around that. I would, I would love to be learning uh, Pure Script and Plutarch alongside more people. Um, see what, uh... Okay. And then, yeah, oh, sorry. And, and Bizwaji, we saw, I saw your question earlier. Um, about Playground, and I see that um, Kevin got Plutus Playground running. That's that's great, 
and it's if you're doing it for your own learning purposes absolutely keep going it's also unnecessary to this course um, you won't need plutus playground directly for anything we're going to do in the next 10 weeks and so to your question trying to install crown note on mix os virtual box okay um are you able to share your screen? Um, you may not have to install Cardano node on NixOS. Uh, what operating system are you running right now? Oh, Curtis already helped, right? Um, do... No, he's still he's still having uh, issues and questions. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm running the um, NixOS on the virtual box and Oh, when I run the tar command, it just unzip the uh, contents of the tar.zag, but it does not install any of them. Um, and underneath your virtual box, what operating system are you running? Oh, it's Windows. It is. Uh, sorry, can I ask what, what's the advantage of using NixOS inside the VM instead of the approach that we, we gave you with the VM that uh, was uh, Mint, Linux, and etc. The thing. Oh, sorry. Oh, I uh, actually. I'm not why sure. did you Why did you go for Nix Linux Nix, Nix OS instead of just oh, the VM? Okay. Um. Maybe, uh, maybe? Because. Yeah. I I like see from the instruction that um, say if, if necessary set up a Linux virtual machine and they said if we're using a Mac OS we don't need to do that so I assume that like using Windows may we, we may encounter more problems. If you want to like install uh, Nix and Cardano, so I set up the Linux first, and I, I I think it will be helpful in the future if I want to um, also um, do other programming in a Linux system. It may be easier. But you said you you have uh, Nix OS, not Linux, yeah. Uh yeah, the uh, Nix OS is based on Linux, right? Okay. Um, Nix, Nix OS will be fundamentally different from Linux, but- Oh, really? Yeah, in a few ways. But if you already have a Linux virtual box running, you have a few options before you even worry about getting into Nix with that, right? So, so the node is independent from Plutus. And it, it serves the purpose of running the Cardano protocol so that you can build transactions and kind of just learn at a low level how to interact with the node a little bit. I would recommend if you already have access to a Linux system to try to follow along with these docs right here, installing the node from source. And not to do this inside of Nix. This is just a great way to just get a feeling for how some other critical Haskell tools like Cabal and GHC work. You'll install those along the way. Uh, but I do not have a, a Linux um, system. Oh, sorry. Oh, you don't have that running on a virtual box. I'm sorry. My, my host OS is on Windows. Then I followed the instruction to have a Linux OS. But you know, you, you, we, have a VM, we have space to download it. We have a VM that you can download. That has, did you notice that part? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that again? In the course, there's a link. Uh -huh. that I, I actually prepared the Linux machine that you can download that, that already has at least Linux running. And from there, you can take up to the setting up of Nix. That should be just a few lines of code. Yeah, so You're not aware of this? 
Okay, I'll, I'll, drop, uh, you, I'll drop you a link. That's well, fine. so I noticed on the course, uh, 101.1 is, it starts with telling you how to, uh, it says to set up NICs, which I started to go down that path. And then I went back and I clicked the next step on the course. And that's like, and then it says, the VM. you can yeah. do it with the VM in Linux. Yeah. So I think maybe that's what. Oh, I guess I, I do not understand the difference between a Nix OS and a Linux. I, I follow the instruction. I had the Linux Mint uh, on, on my computer. Okay, so the, the, the approach that we took is I understand that uh, we decided to take, to put in the, the Nix on 101.1. .1. And then the VM is just a if necessary option inside the 101.1. I think what we wanted to do here was really to try to, you know, facilitate installing Nix from scratch. And if you need to, because I think this, this one was more in the context of Linux already. And if you don't have a, a bare metal Linux, then you can use the VM. And so I think that would be your situation. And I would refer you to this link of setting up your Linux virtual machine. Oh, yeah. Um, I okay. already have this um, virtual box running. Yeah. May, so may I share screen? I think so. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. So. This is the thing I have right now. I hope this is correct. Um, Linux system. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. So I'm trying to install the Card Cardano node, but I don't know how to um, execute and install them. Good. Okay. No, you're in. You're in a great spot right now. This is a good spot to be, and it does look like you are on. Linux and not Nix, so that's good. Yeah, he's using the VM zero yeah. three. You see it on the top left. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Cool. So this, I think this was is the right environment to continue on, and uh, make sure you have the Nix installation in here because what at this version you really only have Linux, and we we let it for you guys to to set up Nix in here, which should be just a few lines of code. Because um, the main challenge is really the environment in terms of OS and bare metal or VM of, of pure Linux. You're going to say? I, I already like, have followed the previous staff, then the Linux Nix shell and the repo are all working. Uh, I'm currently at like topic, I think 102, 102.1. I, I don't know how to execute this. Thing to install the Cardano node. Okay, let me just browse to the number you just said, 102.1. And let's see. Yeah, I see you, you, you're looking at it from, from the folder, like on, on the left window. I don't know yeah. if, you, if you need to download it like that, but uh, it's certainly okay if you explore it like that. But um, then what? Should be the proper way of doing it. Let's see. Let's see what we have here. Isn't there a curl command we've installed in it or something? That's yeah. So when you when you go to um, one hundred two point one, you have a link that just says GitHub input output Cardano node, right? And then from that page, this page is actually a generic page from different different um, OSs. And from this one, I'm pretty sure there was there is another link that you want to follow for Linux, which is the one that says compiling from the sources or something. Bear with oh. me a second. I, so so I, it's, this this file is still not the main one that you want to base your work on. So I, I shouldn't like use the pre-compiled version. I should build it from the source. Yeah, I think that's the consensus between us, not right, James and. Uh, Curtis? I think it's worth it to build from source. Yeah. If, yeah. if the yeah. VM is up and running and ready for it. So, yeah. 
exactly. So if you see there where it says where it says uh, Nix building the node and Cabal building the node, one of those two links is the one that I would that I had followed. Let me just take a look at my notes, please. Um, I think like since in the previous um, uh, modules, we, we have worked with both Cabal and Nix. Um, how do I know which to choose, or I can just either one? Hello. Hey, Jati. Hello. Yeah, I use Kabal, um, but I do know Nix comes with its own uh, implementation of a of of a, of a, of at least the node. But uh, yeah, the Kabal one that's a separate one, and you can play with it and update it without affecting the Nix environment. And uh... okay, so I'm gonna drop you the link that I followed to install from the source in the chat. And to, to the more general question, how do I know when to use Cabal versus Nix? That's actually a really good question. I hadn't thought about that before. Um, it really is on a case by case basis. And the good news is you're not going to have to make that decision too many more times. Um, in, in this case, it, it definitely is more reliable to use Cabal, Nix. I think this Nix documentation is better for somebody who's fully running Nix OS and not just a Nix shell. Um, and just from experience, I know that more people have followed this process right here, building the node with Cabal. But it's a fair question to be like concerned about moving forward. Hey, whoa, if somebody's offering me both options, which one should I do? Yeah, I, I've run all three and, and I agree. I think Cabal is a bit of the most simplest implementation from source actually works just i don't see the difference myself to be honest and it's, that's why i'm glad you asked that question and james i appreciate you answering i ran it with cabal and nix and from source and i didn't really see much of a difference nix was a bit more complicated compared to the other two uh, but it all runs it all runs the same in the end <laughs> so okay and and Defang, just for future reference, because you did ask this in the chat earlier, once you run that tar xvf command, it does extract the executable itself, and then you can just essentially run the executable um, to install it. But there should be uh, your the file extensions are hidden right here. Not sure which one is the executable. That's what we're looking at. Actually, go over to your terminal window instead of this explorer right here. Yeah. And just give us an ls. And so you can see, actually, you have unpacked that tar.gz file. Sorry, I was still getting my bearings when we first looked at this window a few minutes ago. Um, but basically, if you put this directory on your path, then reset this terminal window, you should see that actually Cardano node and Cardano CLI are ready to go. Uh, sorry, um, so I should go to the root directory then? Um, <clears throat> yeah, what's the, actually where is, does anybody know off the top of their head how to update the path on this OS right here? Uh, oh, on Nix OS? No, we're, the same. we're on Linux. So, Linux, no, this is Linux, Linux main. Linux. Uh, yeah. yeah, you just update your, your path variable. Um, and I believe it's just dollar sign, uh, up, all uppercase path. But let me find... I'll, set, I'll put it in the chat. Um, is this where you want it to run from? Is what is that root Cardano Cardano node? Uh, because I'm not sure, so I, I don't want to like extract it in my like root directory. So I created some folder. Absolutely, no, it's better than reference. Path. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh no, that was Windows path variable. You're running. 
You said this is mint. Not that it matters, but there it is. Yeah. Home OS boxes, Cardano, Cardano node. So if you start with this, just to see what is there now, and then use the second command to add that to your path. Should I, should I do this in the root directory, like OS boxes, or it's fine to like- Anywhere, because that path variable is a, is a system variable and no matter where you run it from, uh, it'll just report back what's inside of it. So oop, that actually executed. <laughs> Sorry, I should have. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I must have put a space or something. I don't know why it auto executed, but if you hit your up arrow and then backspace and replace the some new path with the actual path. So you could even use so tilde uh, for root, which is next to the one key on an American keyboard. Will that oh. work, tilde? Uh, generally, yeah, uh, yeah, it depends okay. on the shell. I think in, in Bash it works. I don't know about any others. So yeah, tilde slash, it should it should work like that. And then slash uh, Cardano. Wait, remember, with the C. Get, get path first, right? So dollar sign path, then colon. Dollar sign, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do I need this? Uh, so dollar sign path colon. So you're you're you got the dollar sign, then just path colon. There you go. And I think that works. Slash Cardano node underscore node. And then yeah. up arrow twice to get back to echo path and just verify that it's it so should be appended. I should um, enter this right. Oh, That's I'm sorry. Correct. I thought you yeah. did. I thought you did. I'm yeah, sorry. I haven't. I'm sorry, sorry. Let's see if that works. Then Aquapath? Yep. We just want to validate that it got appended. So you yeah. can see it added home, OS boxes, Cardano, Cardano node. Uh, so now when you try to run Cardano node, it's going to refer to your path system variable and say, okay, I see this directory. I want to look, you know, here for that uh, uh, directory, and what it's going to actually look for is the directory inside Cardano Node called Cardano Node. <laughs> wow, that's a bit confusing. Okay. I, I, well, that's just right because you have a directory named Cardano Node, and then inside <laughs> of it, you can see another directory called Cardano Node. This confused me the first time, well, that's so a, I actually that's an executable there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. I thought that was your directory card on a node with all the libraries inside of it. Never mind. Ignore me. <laughs> Thank you. No, you're good. Then, so you, then from from here, like, uh, what is try, what, what try are we typing, doing here? Yeah. Try typing Cardano dash node and then check the version of it. So space dash B. And make sure that, oh, sorry, here, I'll type it. Cardano dash node is the name of the file that we're running. And then just type dash V like this. Yeah. Yep. Oops, or dash dash version, I'm sorry. Version. And then version spell it out, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm not sure when when you can use uh, abbreviated like dash v versus versus the full. I never know like <laughs> when to, when does that work. Is there a rule about that? Uh, Actually, nice. No, no dash. You don't even need the little dash, but it can work as well without it. Yeah. So you have it. 
even without the first dash. Remove even those two dashes, it should work. Oh, really? Its yeah, version yeah. is built into Cardano Node. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. So it's not an argument. It's it's an actual endpoint essentially. Beautiful. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, and then same thing for Cardano Dash CLI, which is the other program that you now have installed. Yeah, press enter for that. Cool. That those so, are the latest versions. So is this how how Linux work? Because in the past I've only worked with Windows. We have to double click and install it. Right. But here, do we just run the tar then X V F? Then it automatically install them for us. So a, a tar.gz file is the equivalent of a zip file. Okay. All right, just a project archive. And now you see it did, and sorry, I think all of us got confused at first just looking at the folder structure. Um, but yeah, that that tar.gz file unzipped into your Cardano underscore node folder where you now have all of these executables. So Cardano-Node and Cardano-CLI are programs, right? They're executable programs, every bit as much as a web browser is an executable, except that they're executables for the command line, right? They don't, they don't have a, a graphical user interface. They just have a user interface where you can start playing around with both of these programs. Okay. Okay. So so try this. Just type Cardano dash CLI on the command line. And press enter. And this is like your menu. Okay. This shows you all of the commands you can run after typing Cardano CLI. That's a great explanation, James. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. If you find a, a tar file online, it, it can either be like James explained a program that you're really just executing. So you're not installing anything. You're just putting the files somewhere. And when you do do that, you do do need to make sure you're adding that to your path variable, just like we did here, or else your system may not know where to go to look for that. Uh, when you're trying to run the CLI command itself, or it might include an actual installed with a GUI interface. And in that case, you extract it and then find the executable that is your installer and then just execute it like you would normally that way. So there is a difference, but yes, James explained it very clearly. Well, and so, so much of this is going on under the hood, right? When you, when, when I double click an icon to install an application, that double click just triggers a process that runs a whole bunch of stuff like this in the background. And I'm actually, if I, I'm really glad you have this line highlighted right here, this export path, because often when I install applications on a computer, I wanna drag them into an applications folder, okay? And that's actually not what we did here. Instead of dragging these applications into some other folder, we said, hey, export path and add to the path this other folder that we're going to check, in addition to all the places where applications might typically be. Also, by the way, check this Cardano slash Cardano node folder and see if there's any executables there that match the name of what we're trying to execute. You could have just as well moved this entire, all the contents of this Cardano node directory. You could have moved these into any other directory on your path. You see how you've got user local sbin, user local bin, et cetera, right? You could just drop these into any of those, but there are, there are, reasons why in some cases you might not want to. And so in, in a case like this, I prefer to go the route of adding to my path. It just feels safer. Like I'm not going to mess with the contents of some folder where some other critical applications might live. Instead, let me just add this other location to check. And that's what you did. Oh, I see. So um, 
So the proper way is to move the executables into the um, path that's already here. It's an option. Yeah. Ah, I see. I think on Linux you have part of the problem is that you have many different options, and uh, <laughs> but yeah. uh, sometimes it's just the most simple one to start with. Uh, you don't always use on tar either. Sometimes you're just given a uh, a command line which will include an install script or something like a curl command. So you don't necessarily always use tar. Actually, yeah, there, there's one command that makes your path a lot more readable. Instead of just listing it, uh, I'm going to drop it in the chat. Uh, so it starts with the echo part, what I'm just dropping. So if you copy from echo and then all that thing and run it in your machine, on this yeah you see how it looks ah. right now so it's very simple yeah. it's actually you were looking at it all wrapped up and entangled and put together but what's in the path variable yeah. is really just so if you look at it like you were just highlighting it's very ugly if you look at it from here it's really just a list of paths so the problem is that they're all entangled together and if you use this command what it's doing is separating by, by lines separating the, the colons and replacing them with line breaks, and it's a lot easier to read. Okay? Yes, no, no, I get it. Thank you. So the, in overall, like probably guys have been saying, the path is really just a, a list of paths where Linux is gonna look for executables every time you ask, ask for anything to run. It's gonna look at all these for, for something to run that matches. So if you ask for potatoes, it's gonna look for potatoes in all these folders. Okay. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. So yeah. I'm going to stop sharing. That was fun. And yeah, thanks for that, guys. Sure. Um, Trevin's got so now, an update. I just have a quick question. So even in, in the his machine now, uh, I noticed that he already had um, I think it was uh, GH something. You know, all those environments. Does does that all come embedded in the in the Cardano node that he downloaded? Or good. So that was the executable. That mm. um, that is the alternative to building from source. Is just building that whole directory of all the uh, GHC bi right? binaries of all of the required files. Yeah. Okay. Because maybe if we have, we just have five minutes, but I wanted to show you just what I want, what I went through when I was setting up the, those, the, my, my VM. Can I share my screen for a sec? Oh, absolutely. Thank yeah. you, Lucas. Sure. And we can, what often happens in live coding, everybody, is we, we often go a little bit over time because there's plenty to do. Um, so please never feel like you have to stick around past time and any time you're able to spend here, we're happy to have you. Um, so we might go a little over time right now. If you got to drop out, we will see you real soon. Time screen. I had to update my Zoom from yesterday because it was really not working. So let's see if it works better today. Can you see a, a Google Doc? Uh, oh, slow, shoot. Oh, yeah, slow. we got it now. We got it now. Yeah, I always I thought it was going to break down completely. Uh, so this this document is uh, you can see it correctly. Yeah, this is the same document that I sh where where I built the VMs one, two, and three for you, and then we decided to cut it here so that you just had this version and you can set up the uh, mix and all of that because there's so many different ways of doing it. I just wanted to share a bit. So for Nix. What happened here is I really just followed this document, which is the one I think I dropped in the chat just now. And so it should be in a bare metal Linux or a VM inside uh, Windows or whatever environment. It should really just be this document and you have um, those commands about curl and uh, the downloading of, of the actual install. And then you do the uh, environment variables and the cache, and that's it. 
So my, my question here in overall, that's why I was trying to show you this document is that I went through all this journey and that's why I started diverging a bit where I have Nix and then I installed GH Cup because I learned that it includes the GHC and Cabal and etc. And I thought I wasn't gonna need this, but when I eventually came down to the local node part where I have this document that I dropped for you in the chat as well, um, this, these instructions actually tell me that I need to install GH Cup. So that's what I was asking to James now. That's my misunderstanding of um, why do I need GH Cup? It's because I'm running it from the sources. Is that it? So this is another kind of yes and no situation. Yes, you'll need it immediately to build from source, but not if you're downloading binaries. Um, okay. And for anybody who is going any deeper into Haskell, it's one of those things that's nice to have anyway, because you'll you'll use it eventually. Um, most Haskell textbooks will show you how to install GHC up uh, pretty early on. Okay, so um, yeah, so that was what I did. I installed GH Cup to to run even to run the Plutus playground and then I went through all that but um, again what happened here for the local node was I go straight from the Cardano node URL and uh, from there I jumped to this one which is the installing from source and if I followed just this with all the for example here there's two things that are going to need to be installed as prerequisites which are the Libsodium and this library. But as long as you follow through these instructions, it should be really straightforward. They're a bit long and detailed and you know complex, but it should be just everything worked out for me really, really nice. I, I okay. will say just to share with others, sorry, Lucas, but I, I just wanted to sure. add to that real quick. If you choose one of these methods, I do recommend sticking with that. Um, I got a bit confused following all these documentations, Nix, Nix yeah. OS, VM, uh, Cabal, GH Cup. I did it all, uh, but I started out with using uh, Cabal to install Cardano Node, and then I came back and ran with From Source, which advises that you install Libsodium. And when I installed Lib Libsodium, I actually broke my my instance, so I had to uninstall Libsodium, and then everything worked. But I guess my point here is whichever choice you go with, kind of stick with that and follow it through to the end because there might be some conflicts if you try to apply both. And that's all. Are we doing a good enough job of highlighting those different routes, Curtis, do you think? I think so too, but as a couple of people have mentioned here today, since we start with the Nix install and then the next page, we move on to the environment setup. Maybe they're expecting that, oh, my environment should already be set up and I'm running with Nix and then they get confused when they go to the next page. Right. I mean, what are your guys' thoughts? Like, I feel like everything is looks good. It's just that first page doesn't necessarily isn't all that clear on um, if you don't already have Nix installed or some environment, then you can optionally move on to the next page. I don't know. What do you guys think? Or or just preface that install Nix with verbiage. Yeah, separating out the oh, sorry. Go ahead, Stephen. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say separating out the VM from the bare metal. But go on, John. You, you know. It. it said um, here. It says uh, I I guess it's set up Nix on the Linux virtual machine. Would maybe clarify that. You're muted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly like so. Oh, sorry. Do, do this if you want to set up the Nix on the virtual machine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to really sign, really signpost it. Yeah. How to set up 
Nix on a Linux virtual machine. Uh, sorry, sorry. These instructions that that are on the on that document are going to give you a VM that doesn't really have Nix at all. So uh -huh. these instructions are really just to get your VM. And the next step is something that you can do. So th these are not how to set up Nix on the VM uh, per se. It's really just the embed of how to get the VM. Okay. Right. If you want to go down the VM route, so do yeah, you need because to... the VM is the layer. Yeah. If, if you need to put in, well, basically speaking freely, is if you need to put in a, a, a Linux between your Windows and going forward, here's the the Linux VM. I suppose speaking logically, then do we need to say? you have these options you can you can do it on a vm you can do it on bare metal that's what i mean lucas do we need to say that first or that was well, my yeah. thought was in the the original first page so install nix right on that page i'm wondering if we could just break it down okay here's your options to install nix uh -huh. you can use a vm you can use WSL, you can mm -hmm. use you know yes. Docker or whatever the options are. Um, that's kind of what I was like, that's where they're starting, right? They're starting with install Nix, but there's not much there to provide context. And I see how it says download Nix from here and it's Nix OS. Yeah. I think that's why yeah. two or three uh, uh, yes. learners are starting with Nix OS because then they the next page, they go to the VM setup. I wanted to, yeah. And you know, I, I love it because I, I'm getting confused. That means I'm kind of understanding and learning and asking questions. And the, the first question I have is that I do have a Windows 11 system and they install PowerShell 7.25 with Ubuntu 2004, right? So uh, I think I, I'm, I'm in a very good point, a very good position of deciding if I do a virtual machine, uh, a VM and install Linux in there, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, or go the other path, which is bare metal. Can you elaborate on that, please? I just, I don't know. So, so bare metal would be uh, if you abandon Windows altogether and install Linux on your bare metal machine. I think I have that one. Yeah, I have that. that. That's the way I have it right now. I'm sorry for interrupting. But are you saying you, you have you a had boot? Windows? Yeah, I, I mean, my, my original system is Windows 11. So we install um, Ubuntu on that system. Within Windows, right? Well, with, saying... I mean, yeah. This has different operating system or no? Of course. That's not yeah, bare metal. It's, Bare metal oh, is okay. like when you when you turn on your machine, does it boot into Linux or does it boot into Windows? And so bare no. metal would would be. Sorry, go ahead. No, I haven't I haven't gone all the way to go to the BIOS and, and change the the initiation, but um, but the, 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 but it is installed on on. It's so one of the options I have at the minute. Is it a dual boot machine then? Yeah. Or you can boot into Linux or to Windows, or is it? No, 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 Gary. Sorry, just this is what something that I experimented on already. And Windows lets you install Ubuntu as a Windows application. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. And I, I think that under the hood is basically the WSL approach. So uh, yeah. one uh, WSL means Windows Subsystem for Linux. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I think what you're doing there is uh, a bit the approach of running Ubuntu, which is the Linux uh, software um, within the WSL. But yeah. it's still the approach that we have been avoiding a bit because the WSL is sort of a make-believe Linux inside Windows that always causes issues. Okay. So the approach, the, the path that you're on right now with, with your uh, Ubuntu, it's not real Ubuntu, if I can say that. It's really just a make-believe Ubuntu running inside WSL, which is troublesome. And uh, but in, instead of doing what you're doing, maybe using the virtual machine could be an option. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, uh, yeah, maybe I wouldn't advise you to start messing with dual boots and things like those because you may be locked out of your windows altogether. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. super. So I'll do, what I'll do is I'll work on, on installing the virtual machine 
Can, um, can I just ask kind of a concern because on my machine, I have a, a, a Intel i5 with uh, 12 gigs of RAM and it's not very performant for the VM. So can I ask what RAM and CPU you have? You know, I have a i9. Um, I think oh, the okay. RAM is 16. So I'm up there. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with my machine, one thing that if you go through the, the instructions that are on that page that we've been discussing inside Canvas, uh, you'll be able to download VirtualBox, download the VM03 uh, machine, which is 12 gigabytes with a, a ready to run Linux that you can run inside VirtualBox. And um, that virtualization environment, VirtualBox, has something called, uh, I don't know, it's just a CPU option that I think if it runs correctly with your i9, uh, it should be performant enough to go okay. on. Yeah. Great. If not, just ping me directly on Discord. It's just Skywalker or Lucas. And okay, thank I'm you, happy Lucas. Happy to assist. Cheers. Thank you. Great question. So we should advise, advise people not to use the Windows sub, Linux subsystem, or what it's called on Windows. Lucas, do you think? Or Curtis. I tried. I tried it for a while, and I just gave up because uh, mm -hmm. WSL is always, and it's a bit troublesome. We have a successful, uh, you know, by um, the guy Krish, Krish I think. Yeah. Krish, yeah, he's he's he found his way. But as you see, it's weird because you have the the Windows host file system mixed in a bit with with the Ubuntu, and then you can browse the folders, but you, it's a bit troublesome. Yeah, it could be confusing, couldn't it, for people? So maybe in, in we should case, get, yeah. yeah. The VM if, in the end is, is more uh, containerized as long as it's performant enough for you in your machine. Yeah, personally, I actually prefer WSL and that is how I, I run everything. But I will agree that um, I prior to doing so, I had a familiarity with WSL. Uh, so... I was able to walk through and troubleshoot if I got an error during the install, I, I was able to kind of like figure it out. Um, maybe that's, you know, introducing too many new things. So if they're not familiar with WSL, then maybe that's not the route to go. Because uh, there was only a couple of things that I had to do outside of the traditional documentation. And one of them was to actually create a Nix directory, then a Nix.conf file. However, that wasn't necessary. You could create a Nix.conf file in your home directory and then point, you know, point to that uh, directory itself. So there were a couple of things that just fell outside of the standard documentation um, in the WSL. So that was, I'd say, the biggest headache. Uh, but now that it's running for me, I actually find it a bit smoother in my case because I do have both a VM setup and a WSL setup. Now in the VM setup, you it's a bit more manual in the way that you allocate resources uh, to the VM, whereas WSL has a pr pretty nifty um, relationship with the Windows OS itself. So it will allocate as much memory and CPU as it can afford, right, to the WSL. Whereas the VM, it's a bit more hard coded um, and you have to play with it until you get that right, nice balance uh, of resources. Yeah, currently the VM is only uh, getting uh, four gigabytes of your memory. And eventually, you want to go into VirtualBox and grant more RAM to the VM, up to eight or even uh, ten gigabytes of RAM to the to the VM, so that it's really performing. Yeah, I agree. And Lewis, you had your hand up. Yes, uh, I just want to um, to say that uh, uh, I started with WSL as well, but. Um, but my reason was a bit different. Uh, the reason why I decided to go to uh, um, a, a virtual machine, but in cloud, because, uh, and, and, and probably that will help also, Juan, uh, you ask for the resources of your local machine, but uh, you need to keep in mind also your hard drive space of, uh, because, when when I when I tried to download the uh, Cardano blockchain, I didn't have enough uh, space, and that's a problem in my machine. Uh, I, it takes uh, I don't know how much it takes, but it takes about thirty gigs or something. Uh, 
I guess. And then, then that's why I, with WSL and even VirtualBox, I, I, I couldn't run in my machine. So I have to move to cloud because of that, uh, yeah, you know, uh, my limited resource in terms of hard drive. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, very good point. Cause actually my, mine has grown into 60 or 90 gigs for, for, for mine. So especially dealing with Nix and, and Cabal. Thanks for bringing that up, Louis. Samuel? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if, so if you're booting into Nix from the bare metal, um, like, are you, like, Lucas, are you in the Zoom meeting right now on Nix? Uh, not in the Nix shell at the moment. But I'm in Linux. Are you asking Nix OS, Samuel? Well, just when, so when you're, because it seems like one advantage of doing the virtual machine is that I can alternate between my native operating system and the, and then um, yeah, do all the, you can organize your, your documents and everything in, in Windows and then just go inside the machine to do your commands. It's really practical right. if, if, for example, in my case, because I just have 12 gigs of RAM and uh, my CPU wasn't mapping properly. So I just had two virtual cores inside Linux. So that's why I gave up. And literally I have one laptop on my left side with all my documents in Windows and another laptop, which is bare metal in, in Linux. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say bare metal is a good option if you are familiar with Linux and already, you know, kind of comfortable with operating or maybe already have a bare metal Linux OS, then just go that route. I mean, VMs do tend to have resource needs, but if you have a powerful computer, maybe it could be practical to use VMs. Yeah. There are some features with VMs which are quite nice, like snapshots. So you could you could set up an environment and then take a snapshot of it and then do some work. And if something goes wrong, you could roll back to the snapshot, that kind of thing. But in general, like bare metal would be better. I use an operating system called Pop OS, which is Linux based, and it it feels as familiar as using Windows or a Mac. Um, and so I, I think the term bare metal can also be a little bit misleading, right? Just think of it as a Linux machine. You, you, there's Macs, there's Windows, there's Linux. Yeah. When, when you start up a Linux machine, you're not running Nix yet, okay? So even though I have a Linux machine with this Pop! OS operating system on it, I still have to start up my Nix shell inside of the Plutus apps repo. And that's where Nix comes in. So I'm not actually using Nix as an operating system. I'm starting it already once I have, have Linux turned on. Okay, so thank you, that, that clarified. Yeah. yeah, and that's the same thing that will happen in the VM, right? You, you open up the VM, which is like turning on a Linux machine. And then from inside of that Linux machine, now you run Nix. Um, uh, if, if we have seen through the environment a bit, I just wanted to share my screen to, to, to ask you a few questions about what I see in my Project 01 folders. Is that, would that be okay? Yeah, that's great. great. Thank you. Let's see if it doesn't freeze. And my screen. So now at this instance, I don't have Nix shell running. I just, I just browsed back to uh, my PBL course folder inside. I have the project one folder, but I know that I have already run in here the um, the module of the training that says compile it, and you should have your output folder with this. So what I wanted to do is really just show it, run it by you guys, because for me this is new as well. And um, when I came here and ran this, I created the output folder, and I found this in there, which really is a bit like what what is this so what happened and that's what i wanted to to run by you because 
uh, I see here there's the Cabal project, uh, which is really just sort of like yarn or, or yeah. all those other package management things are, isn't it? Yeah. And then there's this. Is this the smart contract? I don't think so. Right? Excellent. And, and then we actually have Haskell here. Yeah. And so my question is, are these two files the same way that they were when I downloaded the package? And what happened here? What, what, what did the actual compiling of it did between probably these three files? And this, yeah. okay, so this will not be the only time this question is answered, um, but let's, this is such an important question right now. So anybody who wants to just get a little bit ahead, awesome. And Lucas, congrats on getting this far. Um, so first of all, the always succeeds cabal and the cabal.project files, those are, think of those as configuration files, okay? And there's yeah. no smart contract, um, sin, you know, no smart contract code in these files. These are just helping us set up the project, point to dependencies, and ultimately, this thing here. yeah, exactly, and ultimately, right, be able to run Plutus code. Okay. In the source project one file, yeah, you've got these two files that for now are provided. In future project modules, we won't provide just a ready to go file and then and say compile it. You'll start to build your own files, but we just wanted you to have this full stack experience first. This my first Plutus script has all of the business logic for the smart contract inside of it. And that's a little hard to see because there is no business logic in this validator. Okay, this, this, this validator is so basic that you're not even seeing any business logic yet. All you're seeing is something that always succeeds. That's hence the name, right? On lines 10 and 11, we have what's called a, a valid, well, the validator function is on line 13, I guess, but we're basically at, at the core of writing Plutus code is starting from the template you see on lines 10 and 11, putting together a validator that takes three inputs, which for now are just built-in data, built-in data, built-in data, and return this open and close parentheses. That's called a unit in Haskell. But you see on line 11, the three underscores. Yeah. What that basically says is no matter what is passed to this validator, just return success. Just say we're successful. Okay. And so in the rest of this course, we will replace those underscores with actual constraints that might pass or might fail. And that's what a validator does. It's either going to pass or fail. And that's what contracts can do, right? So essentially, what we need to do is we need to take this code right here that's someday going to have business logic into it, and we have to turn it into something that the Cardano protocol can read to decide whether a transaction should pass or fail. And so that's like a, sorry, yep. sorry. Go, go, go. Is this like a, a null contract then, like a hello world contract it just says, I'm a contract, I will always succeed. <laughs> this, is, this is the hello, take my money contract. Yes, and you're gonna <laughs> learn later in this course how to hack this contract, okay? Yeah, this is this is the everybody can take everything anytime they want to contract. And so okay. we need to go through a two step process to take this code right here and turn it into something readable. And those two steps are first to compile a Plutus script, which now you've done. As you said, you okay. looked at what was in the output folder, my first script.plutus, and you looked at it, you said, okay, what the heck is this? Well, what is it? Well, the type of what this is, is a Plutus script. 
And by the way, it's a V1 through the script. That's going to be rele uh, relevant soon enough. Okay. Okay. Description is optional, but anytime you're building a lot of scripts, and for example, if I was on a team and wanted to share this with somebody, I could just add a message there if I wanted to, or a name of this contract so it's easier to track. And then finally, we have the on-chain readable version of the contract itself. And that's what you see on line four. This is exceptionally long. Once we get to writing Plutus contracts that actually do something, that Seabor hex string, it might be a thousand characters long. But this one is extremely short because there's really no logic embedded in that validator. So this is the contract. That's it. Yes. OK. okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> now, what we haven't done yet, but what is offered as the extension for this module is to go the next step of the way, which is to take this Plutus script and, and build from it a Cardano address. Just like we can build an address from a verification key, when you set up a wallet with Cardano CLI, we can build an address from a Plutus script. So in a sense, the contract is the beginning of a transaction. Uh, okay, now we're getting to this. This is the key definition. And it, I mean, you have to kind of think, okay, is the contract the noun or the verb, right? And, and if it's a noun, when is it enforced? Or if it's a verb, when is the thing done, right? But either way, this is where the address is really important. Yeah. I can send assets to a contract address anytime. Nothing is ever stopping anyone from sending UTXOs to a contract address, just like all of us can send UTXOs, ADA, assets, et cetera, to each other anytime, right? And just by looking at it, if I had a list of contract addresses and just wallet addresses that belonged to people, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the contract addresses and the wallet addresses. Mm, yeah. There is a caveat though. Sorry about the sirens. Sorry, can I, can I stop that... sharing them? Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, so, sure. so last just so we can see each other. But, this is yeah. just a preview of what's to come. But when I send a UTXO to a contract address, I must include what's called datum on it. We'll talk about datum a lot. And in order to unlock UTXOs from a contract, I need to have that dot Plutus file that Lucas was just showing us. Okay, that's, it, so the, I'm gonna all oversimplify, but that Plutus script file is basically playing the same role as your private key does. Ron. Yeah. Okay. Right. To unlock funds, it, right? From my wallet, I need my private key to unlock my UTXOs. From a contract, I need the Plutus script to unlock the UTXOs. The so difference could... being that when I'm unlocking with a Plutus script, I have to add some extra information or meet some additional requirements. And that's what's checked in the business logic of the validator. So, you're essentially building a concatenated encrypted transaction, um, which has some prerequisites in it, like you said, it must have datum that will ex really just execute a transaction. <laughs> That's it. That's all we can do to build a DAP. Yeah. You must think fundamentally about transactions that take inputs and produce new outputs. I love that explanation, James. <laughs>
Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Oh, it's so much. It's this, I mean, <laughs> this is where it gets fun, right? You just have to get everybody through the, these first environment setup pieces. And if we can, and if we have to get creative to do so, we're going to do it. Yeah, because once this part is done, take a deep breath because now we get to do the fun part, right? And this is, yeah, it's it's mind blowing to start thinking in this way. I still don't, I don't believe like in an intuitive way inside of me that Plutus is Turing complete, right? I, I, yeah. have, I haven't like embraced that yet as an idea that I fully buy as my own. For now, I'm still trusting it to be, right? I've heard it is. Is it, is it, <laughs> is it, prov is it provably true and complete? Is, it, is that... Yes, but I, I'm not smart enough to understand the proof. So, you know, I'm just okay. <laughs> well, thanks. You took me beyond the limit of my knowledge there because I, okay. I was aware of the UTX explanation from Lars. I understood conceptually the transaction basis. I understand that, but I've never seen that. As a script, and I kind of, although I don't know quite how to write that, I get it. I, I, it's it's basically the hex is just encrypting, it, essentially, isn't it? Yep. You know, and right. it's and it's just a concatenation of different instructions, really. You know, it encoded, in fact, right? Not even encrypted, right? So there's there's no security. All oh, right. Okay. To, okay. Of course, there wouldn't be with that. Right? You're not, wouldn't be security, there's nothing yeah. hidden about what the Plutus script itself can do. Right? I should have watched no, that. I should have, I should I should have watched that video by that person you suggested. Said, yeah, yeah, it's one of the, I was using one of those uh, errors. It's nothing to do with encryption, is it really? Yeah. You know, it's about encoding, as you say, which is much quite different, you know. And when it's only encoding, well, where the heck does the security come from? from the, the signing of the transaction itself. Perhaps from the signing with keys. And the compiler or the, the validator, sorry. Right, the, so the validator can say, well, this, this contract can only be locked if the unlocking, or can only be unlocked if the unlocking transaction is signed by th these one or more keys. But that's not the only rule, right? It can be unlocked if this or that token is present in one of the inputs or outputs to a transaction. It could have to do with time as well. And with with essentially those those are those are the building blocks, right? Just based on those, and then our ability to just have arbitrary data in the datum that's enough hmm. I see. I'm, I'm intrigued about the keys i must admit because um there's a kind of security in the openness um <laughs> which sounds contradictory contradictory intuitively but when you think about it that is a kind of form of security in itself um yeah Absolutely, because now you can see what that validator is doing, you and you know that you're running the same version of the script that they're advertising or that they're publicizing. So you can make sure and validate that this is exactly what's happening. My funds are not going somewhere else. My assets are not being transferred. You can so just validate that, that. that could be described as trustless. That trustless has always been the mind bending word. Is it trustless or is it trust? Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I would say, right. It's trustless in the sense that as a user of a script or, or an adapt, um, I can validate what's happening inside that script. So yeah. it's trustless in the sense that I don't need to trust the person that's yeah. creating the application. I can trust that I can read that application and that validator. And sorry, I just I want to I just realized Roberto and Luis had these questions. Um, Roberto, that's exactly right. My first Plutus compiler is what we would refer to as off-chain code, whereas the the Plutus script or sorry the validator script itself is what we 
use the shorthand on-chain code for. Yeah. The, the cloud thing is interesting for another reason. Um, and it actually is high utility and it is used in production. And here's why. We just saw on Lucas's screen, okay, a validator can take three inputs and actually those three inputs, because it's Haskell, are specific things, right? They, we, we know what those are. So if you've heard the terms datum, redeemer, and context, you will see soon enough how those three things appear as the inputs to a validator. However, you don't have to stop with those you can parameterize a function. And I just think about this in algebraic terms, like obviously in algebra, I can tell you that X equals two, but I could also tell you that X is equal to three Y, right? And it depends on another variable. It's got this parameter that if I know it, now I know the value of X. The very same thing with validators. I can add an additional parameter or variable to an entire validator and give myself a family of functions just like 3y would represent a family of potential values or a set of potential values for x. What this means is that based on the parameter that you're using when you compile the validator, you can get incrementally different versions of a contract script that runs on the same business logic, but represents a slightly different version, Curtis's version of the contract versus Lucas's version of the contract and so on and so forth. But in order to use those, they've gotta be uniquely compiled and you have to derive the unique contract addresses that would stem from each of those unique instances of the contract. And both of those steps have to happen on a machine somewhere, right? So if you're building a, a fully scaled DAP, you're absolutely gonna need a server running whatever it takes to compile instances of contracts on demand and then and then if you set up that part the creating an address from that is relatively trivial with you know, one line from cardano cli right um, but, the, but these are all things to consider so i didn't realize that earlier but you know we have this kind of immediate teaching reason to think about cloud services but they do have a, a more enduring use case too So, Jay, did you say um, date and redeemer and context? That's okay. right. That's Thanks. right. Yeah, and will those are those are the ABCs of validators. Those are we will touch those consistently over the next few weeks. I just wanted to uh, re not reiterate, but just agree with Stephen's sentiment. I I went through PPP and not once do i feel like the outcome of going through that packaged that information about a pluto script in the way that you did that you just did i don't feel like i you know ended the ppp understanding that oh a pluto script is really just an address and you can send anything to it but to interact with it you need to unlock the utxos which passes through the validator it's just i, I don't feel like i came to that conclusion through ppp so i'm appreciative that that's how you're you're packaging it thanks yeah absolutely there was well and ppp had a great deal of emphasis on the plus application backend right and so and that's what i found when i got to the end of it i just found like i was way behind always trying to wrap my mind around what the pav was doing and never really thinking fundamentally about why we needed it in the first place. And the PAB is extremely powerful. 
when when it is rolled out completely and accessible to everyday developers that's going to be awesome <laughs> that's going to be it's it's a very very powerful tool but if i had to sum it up in one thing what does the pab do oh it builds transactions it builds valid transactions that's what it does right accounting for hey we've got these wallets over here we've got these tokens we've got these different things that might be relevant to the construction of valid transactions it takes care of so much of that for us but at the end of the day that's all it's doing building transactions that are going to satisfy the on-chain validator and i didn't i wasn't able to like step back because of thinking about that all the time until getting through ppp and just like yeah. thinking through the same thing i was like why why don't I feel like I have a picture of this? So well, from a philosophical angle, one thing that intrigued me, I've known you for a while, but the pieces coming together, like because uh, you don't actually change anything on train. You you, you you just write once. That's it. You don't now that is Turing complete. You know, because if you, you look at the classic Turing example, you don't rewrite. Mm. You just continue you punch the tape and the tape keeps running. <laughs> So that's why it's Turing complete. That's one reason. That's not the only reason. But the and when you start thinking about that in transactional terms, it's really fascinating conceptually. It just changes the way you think about uh, because it, because if you can't change anything in a way, why is that a good thing? It's a good thing because it's also a date holds data. It means that the data is immutable, and that's a feature. <laughs> you know, it's not a bug. It's a feature. You know, so. well, I've, I'm always wondering what's the utility of this. So I, I just and I just recorded the first two videos for module 201 this morning. And I and I tried to I didn't want to overemphasize this bit, but we're going to get there. But this idea that when you're building a transaction, building it is just step one. And only after do you successfully build a transaction then can you sign it and finally submit it to the blockchain where it's final. But that build step is incredibly robust because it mm -hmm. tells you over and over again why your transaction failed, right? And so as a learning exercise, using Cardano CLI just to build over and over again and see all the different ways that a build step can fail is so powerful because there's never a risk, right? Mm, yeah. You, there's no risk because we're not spending anything. We're just asking, ooh, could I spend those UTXOs this way? What about this way? What about this way? What about that way, right? And every time it fails, the trivial reason being the wrong, you know, you're, oh no, you don't even get to the signing step, right? You, you won't even know that, right? So. It's it's more basic reasons than even looking for a signature. It's hey, is the are the assets on this transaction balanced, right? Another thing it reminds me of is the concept of the state machine. So, so the blockchain is a state machine <laughs> in that sense. You know, I mean, on a very trivial level, it all. But that's really, yeah, yeah. It's the state of these UTXOs right now. Curtis stayed way late with us. That was fun. Um, okay, well, in in Gimbal Labs fashion, we do this sometimes. Uh, just go way over time, and uh, it's it's a luxury when we when we're able to. So thanks for everybody who's able to stick around. Roberto, Trevin, Sam, Nelson, and Luis, Stephen, Sebastian, Lucas. Thanks, guys. Thank right. you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, okay, hey, everybody give a virtual hug to somebody who's struggling with NICs. We're going to keep helping those folks out so we can get to the good stuff. Um, we'll pick all this stuff up next week. And actually, oh, Sebastian, somebody had a question in the chat. Was that Roberto? About which day the Emergo session is. Do you know? Dude, 25? 
That's what I wanted to say. Monday the 25th, but did we send, was there another calendar invite out there that might have said the 26th? You talk to 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 the more okay. I I'm I will check the the, the dates and I'll send you the, the to the Discord. In Discord, okay. okay. Yeah, Roberto, thanks for checking on that too. I I totally had 25th in my mind, but I might be wrong. Um, and I want to use. We are talking about the 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 the, the call with uh, Roberto. Right. Uh, I'm gonna check. I wish yeah, and I'll double check with him too to see what date he had. All right. Okay. Um, so see everybody Monday for that or at the latest next Wednesday. Um, can you share the recording? Is it gonna be on the Gimbal Labs YouTube? I'm oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna put each of these videos on the Gimbal Labs YouTube and I'm collating all of them directly in the Canvas course. Okay. Because I really want to review your explanation of the smart contract concept. Oh boy, I hope I got it right. <laughs> Share some. No, 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 no. I just, I just want to learn from it. Obviously, I had a brief skim through the other day's recording. It was quite useful, James. Well, All so right. So, good things. Cheerio. All right. Cheers. Have a good one. Cheers, guys. See you.